Mrs. Pontellier was not a woman given to confidences, a characteristic hitherto contrary to her nature. Even as a child she had lived her own small life, all within herself. At a very early period she had apprehended instinctively the dual life, that outward existence which conforms, the inward life which questions. That summer at Grand Isle she began to loosen a little the mantle of reserve that had always enveloped her. There may have been, there must have been, influences, both subtle and apparent, working in their several ways to induce her to do this. But the most obvious was the influence of Adèle Chatenul. The excessive physical charm of the Creole had first attracted her, for Edna had a sensuous susceptibility to beauty. Then the candor of the woman's whole existence, which everyone might read, and which formed so striking a contrast to her own habitual reserve. This might have furnished a link. Who can tell what metals the gods use in forging the subtle bond which we call sympathy, which we might as well call love? The two women went away one morning to the beach together, arm in arm, under the huge white sunshade. Edna had prevailed upon Madame Chatagnol to leave the children behind, though she could not induce her to relinquish a diminutive role of needlework which Adele begged to be allowed to slip into the depths of her pocket. In some unaccountable way they had escaped from Robert. The walk to the beach was no inconsiderable one, consisting as it did of a long, sandy path, upon which a sporadic and tangled growth that bordered it on either side made frequent and unexpected inroads. There were acres of yellow chamomile reaching out on either hand. Further away still, vegetable gardens abounded, with frequent small plantations of orange or lemon trees intervening. The dark green clusters glistened from afar in the sun. The women were both of goodly height, Madame Chatignol possessing the more feminine and matronly figure. The charm of Edna Pontellier's physique stole insensibly upon you. The lines of her body were long, clean, and symmetrical. It was a body which occasionally fell into splendid poses. There were no suggestion of the trim, stereotyped fashion plate about it. A casual and indiscriminating observer, in passing, might not cast a second glance upon the figure, but with more feeling and discernment he would have recognized the noble beauty of its modeling, and the graceful severity of poise and movement which made Edna Pontellier different from the crowd. She wore a cool muslin that morning, white, with a waving vertical line of brown running through it, also a white linen collar and the big straw hat which she had taken from the peg outside the door. The hat rested anyway on her yellow-brown hair, that waved a little, was heavy, and clung close to her head. Madame Chatignol, more careful of her complexion, had twined a gauze veil about her head. She wore dogskin gloves, with gauntlets that protected her wrists. She was dressed in pure white, with a fluffiness of ruffles that became her. The draperies and fluttering things which she wore suited her rich, luxuriant beauty, as a greater severity of line could not have done. There were a number of bathhouses along the beach, of rough but solid construction, built with small protecting galleries facing the water. Each house consisted of two compartments, and each family at Lebrun's possessed a compartment for itself, fitted out with all the essential paraphernalia of the bath and whatever other conveniences the owners might desire. The two women had no intention of bathing. They had just strolled down to the beach for a walk and to be alone and near the water. The Pontellier and Chatignol compartments adjoined one another under the same roof. Mrs. Pontellier had brought down her key through force of habit. Unlocking the door of her bathroom, she went inside and soon emerged, bringing a rug, which she spread upon the floor of the gallery, and two huge hair pillows covered with crash, which she placed against the front of the building. The two seated themselves there in the shade of the porch, side by side, with their backs against the pillows and their feet extended. Madame Chatagnol removed her veil, wiped her face with a rather delicate handkerchief, and fanned herself with the fan which she always carried suspended somewhere about her person by a long, narrow ribbon. Edna removed her collar and opened her dress at the throat. She took the fan from Madame Chatagnol and began to fan both herself and her companion. It was very warm, and for a while they did nothing but exchange remarks about the heat, the sun, the glare. But there was a breeze blowing a choppy, stiff wind that whipped the water into froth. It fluttered the skirts of the two women and kept them for a while engaged in adjusting, readjusting, tucking in, securing hairpins and hatpins. A few persons were sporting some distance away in the water, 